I was watching an Emperor Tiger Star video and came across this. It piqued my interest, so I decided to look into it further. The Norwegian government loaned the Fram a ship to Captain Otto Sverdrup, along with 20,000 kroner to maintain it, or around 1,100 British pounds at the time. The Fram was the first Norwegian-built ship for polar exploration, specially designed to withstand pack ice without getting crushed. The ship could even travel on top of the polar ice. It launched in 1892, and Otto Sverdrup would be made its captain in 1898 to lead the second Fram expedition. They modified it for the second expedition, adding six cabins, a galley, extra insulation, and improving its stability with a false keel. Since it came back from the first expedition successfully without getting crushed by ice and disappearing forever, five scientists were willing to join the second Fram expedition alongside ten crew members. Using it, Captain Otto Sverdrup and his crew from 1899 to 1902 would explore the previously unexplored western coast of Ellesmere Island and discover and explore Axel Heiberg Island alongside Elef Rignes and Amund Rignes Island the three collectively known as the Sverdrup Islands. Captain Sverdrup would claim these lands for the Norwegian crown. A booklet attributed to Sverdrup would assert that they built a cairn on the northwest coast of Axel Heiberg Island, with a declaration that the expedition took possession of all the land they discovered in the name of the Kingdom of Norway, at the time united with the Kingdom of Sweden. Smith writes that the positive attitude that British explorers had towards the discovery encouraged Sverdrup's claims. Smith provides a quote illustrating this sentiment from Admiral Sir Leopold McClintock, stating, We looked upon that part of the Arctic region as so peculiarly our own that we spoke of it as if the Queen's writ was free to run through it even to the North Pole. But we can no longer make that boast. Captain Sverdrup has been there, and he has discovered other lands farther north so that we cannot look for any immediate increase to the British Empire in that direction. Captain Sverdrup's claims would be a source of anxiety for Canadian officials, though Smith notes that they were more alarmed by American activity in the Arctic, since the islands were presumably de facto part of Canada under the 1880 Adjacent Territories Order and the 1895 and 1897 Canadian Orders in Council. However, the fact that no Brit or Canadian discovered the islands meant that Sverdrup's claims still held some weight, and none would set foot on the islands until after World War I. Smith writes, Evidently, Sverdrup continued to badger the Norwegian government during these years. According to Fairley, the explorer visited the Norwegian Foreign Office in Oslo, periodically to make sure his islands were not completely forgotten. Norway was disinterested in claiming the islands, and this disinterest would only raise Canadian fears over American claims, since they fear that the Macmillan expedition would try and claim Axel Heiberg Island and even Ellesmere Island for America, leading to a territorial dispute. Norway cared for other territorial disputes, like their Antarctic claims. This is exemplified during a dispute with the British over Bouvet Island where they offered to drop their claims over the Sverdrup Islands, despite the fact they never publicly claimed the islands. This lack of interest is contrasted by Norwegian Prime Minister Johan Ludwig Moenko, Smith writing in a widely publicized speak at Bergen on 10th November about Norwegian policy in the polar regions, Norwegian Prime Minister Johan Ludwig Moenko refused to recognize British and Canadian sector claims in the Antarctic and Arctic saying that these territories could be claimed only through occupation, and that the claimant nations had not as yet fulfilled this requirement. Norway had played an important part in the polar regions, he said, and had special interests in both. This would revive Canadian anxiety over Norway in the Arctic, and letters would be sent between the two nations and their diplomats to reach a settlement, with a framework established by February 1930, one that compensated Captain Sverdrup for his discovery. Smith writes that misunderstandings, complications, and disagreements meant that the settlement process was long and drawn out. Smith added that the Canadian government insisted on formalities and Norway was not very interested in the affair. Bordewick, who was Captain Sverdrup's legal representative, was the only one interested in hastening the settlement. 
especially since Captain Sverdrup was ill. The negotiations concluded on November 5th, with Captain Sverdrup receiving 67,000 Canadian dollars in payment. The news over the settlement was made public on November 11th, 1930, with Norway recognizing Canadian sovereignty over the archipelago. Since July, Captain Sverdrup had a rapidly developing cancer, so he profited very little from the affair, dying on November 26, 1930. Interestingly enough, the Fram not only sailed the Arctic, but would go to Antarctica in the third Fram expedition. Not only that, but the ship was preserved and is now at a museum a big day near Oslo. Their site was a useful source of information on the ship. I must also credit this book by Gordon W. Smith for much of the information here. It's nice to see that even today the islands retain their Norwegian names. William Barr wrote in 1984, Were he still alive, however, Sverdrup would undoubtedly have been raising a storm in the Norwegian press and in the storting during the past decade, because in the 1970s, surveys discovered reserves of both natural gas and oil. It's amusing to wonder what if Norway asserted a claim over the island and somehow kept them, or if the Canadians' worst fears were realized and Americans saw Norwegian indifference as a free pass to claim the islands for themselves.